Hi, I'm Marty Nemco. I've talked previously about simple self-employment. For example, uh, I wrote an article called Low Risk, High Payoff Self-Employment. You can Google that in the word Nemco, and you'll find it. But those kind of articles and little talks were in kind of standard form. They're an annotated list. And But some people learn better when advice is embedded in a context. So here is a composite story. Sonia was one of the many burned out physicians. She was tired of insurance companies and Medicare cut, cutting the payments to her and, adding insult to injury, requiring massive paperwork and effectively telling her how to practice. All that atop the seemingly growing percentage of patients who don't show for appointments and of those who do fail to follow even urgent recommendations, for example, to take life-saving medications let alone stop overeating, smoking, and doing drugs. Sonia considered a range of non-clinical MD options from hospital administration to reviewing patient lawsuits against physicians, but none of those sufficiently motivated her to pick one. She decided she wanted out of medicine completely. Sonia's parents back in China happily ran a flower stand near a bus station, and Sonia decided to maintain the family tradition by starting one or more in the U.S. Realizing the importance of location, Sonia's first step was to learn about the government restrictions on and regulations governing flower stands near bus and train terminals, places where in the morning many people are wanting to buy a thank you present for a co-worker or an apology present for a co-worker or boss, and then after work, there are people who want to try to make up with their sweetie. Sony, Sonia found that some jurisdictions prohibit anything other than government-owned enterprises. In other locales, new businesses, new business licenses mainly go to underrepresented minorities. But a few jurisdictions did not erect such daunting roadblocks. Yeah, they'd be a long application and review process. But Sonia felt that a prime location would be worth it. Knowing how lengthy the process could be, though, she didn't quit her MD job until she got the permit for her first location. Sonia knew that her business's name has profit potential, so she didn't squander it with a neutral name like Sonia's Flowers. She considered memorable names like Bloomers, In Bloom, Bloom Room, Flower Feast, Flirty Flowers, and Big Buds. She loved Big Buds, but feared that even a single person who objected to that name's non-floral allusions could mount a damaging social media campaign against her business. So Sonia ended up choosing Flower Tower. That was memorable and could tie in with a clever merchandising strategy, and that is to arrange the flower shelves on a pyramidal tower with the highest price items at the top, which could increase profitability because people like to be at the top and because those high price items would be near eye level. Sonia had no carpentry skills, so she hired someone to build the tower and used a great website called 99designs to have a contest for designing the logo and signage. Sonia decided that, especially with a highly perishable item like flowers, and especially at the, be the beginning of the business when cash flow is critical and likely limited, she would limit her inventory to the most popular flowers. She determined what those were with some internet research, visiting and watching what's selling at nearby flower stands, as well as the city's wholesale flower market. She asked vendors there for advice on which flowers yield the most profitability per square foot, considering, of course, shelf life. As a result, Sonia ended up deciding to sell just long-stemmed red, pink, and yellow roses, mixed in-season bouquets comprised of flowers that were popular and that are in season and thus could be bought inexpensively. Once she's identified her product mix, she negotiated with vendors to get the best ratio of price to quality. Although Sonia didn't want a career at a flower stand, she knew that the best way to learn the business was to do that for the first weeks until she felt she understood everything, customer preferences and problems, price objections, merchandising for maximum profit, efficient processes for bouquet creation, theft control, and ideal hours, for example, 8 to 7 every day or 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. and 4 to 7 p.m. weekdays only. 
Once Sonia felt she understood her business well enough, she recruited a trusted friend to run the flower stand. Choosing a trusted person is especially wise here because this is a significantly cash business and despite inventory control, there is risk. Sonia picked someone who's also conventionally attractive in appearance and personality, which should increase sales. And of course, Sonia chose somebody reliable who would show up on time, treat customers kindly even when they're rude, and keep the place clean and attractive. The friend that Sonia chose had no experience with flowers, let alone with flower arranging, but Sonia realized that those could be taught. She simply had her friend watch a few YouTube videos, practicing as she watched. Sonia paid for her for that training time. And on the job, Sonia also paid her well, including profit sharing. She did that both for ethical reasons and to encourage employee loyalty and to decrease the risk of employee theft. Sonia then turned her attention to securing an outstanding second location, and then her third, and then her fourth, which was in front of a busy hospital. She named that flower stand Feel Good Flowers. After establishing four successful locations, Sonia was clearing low six figures, and at that point she stopped expanding, knowing that additional expansion risked decreases in quality and certainly would require yet more oversight, which is not fun. So at that point she sold the business to another friend. Sonia is now doing the research on starting another business, providing one-on-one -on -one and group coaching plus retreats for burned out physicians. Here are the major takeaways, the major tips for starting a low risk, high payoff business that were embedded in this story. Choose a product that isn't subject to trend risk. Cigars were hot and then they were not. Frozen yogurt was cool until it wasn't. Unless the economy so collapses that most people are buying only necessities, demand for flowers will remain as long as birthdays occur, people need to apologize, and tokens of love are to be sent. Location, location, location. As with real estate, perhaps the three most important factors for a brick and mortar retailer are relocation, location, and location. You must take governmental restrictions into account up front. Most jurisdictions have burdensome regulations and costs, but there can be significant variation across locales. Your business's name is an asset not to be squandered. Too many businesses decide to name their business after a relative or even after some arcana they're fond of. A business's name must be descriptive and memorable. And these tips can help. They need to be possibly rhyming, clever, and tie in with the store's distinctive feature and brevity. The name Flower Tower that Sonia used incorporated them all. Be aware of threats. Of course, be aware of competitors. Sonia would have been foolish to open her flower stand next to a Trader Joe's, which sells flowers at low prices. But there are less obvious threats. For example, today's social media gives inordinate power to people who know how to use it well. Even just one such person could, without spending a penny, devastate a business. So if there's even a small risk of offending someone, discretion is often the better part of valor. Don't delegate prematurely. To preserve cash flow and quality, first, do as much as you can by yourself. That also enables you to fully understand every aspect of your business. Then, as appropriate, delegate. Cash is a business's lifeblood. If your cash flow is poor, you can be out of business, even if in just a few more months you could have been profitable. A business without blood, that is money, has a short life expectancy. That's another reason that Sonia did as much as she could herself, where possible, hiring by the hour or project and didn't take on a, a partner with whom she'd have to share half the profits and half the control. Pay honorably. Of course, when Sonia needed someone to run the, 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 the flower stand or stands, she needed to hire people and pay them, and she paid them well. If she runs her business efficiently and cognizant of how to meet all government requirements without business busting costs, there should be enough money left to pay honorably and leave Sonia adequate compensation for all her work, her ability, and her risk taking. Hire wisely. You must take the time to hire wisely. And because job seekers have a wealth of tools, legal and <coughs> extra legal, to look better as applicants than they would be as employees, a small business like Sonia's was wise to choose trusted friends as the first hires. In hiring, unless the job requires a skill that requires years to master, like computer programming, 
it's usually wise to hire on intelligence, integrity, and reliability. And finally, don't be greedy. Recognize that after a certain point, whatever benefits derived from expanding your business are often outweighed by a decrease in the quality of the product or service and a decrease in the quality of your life. Know when enough money is enough. A side benefit of growing only to the business's point of diminishing returns is that it leaves plenty of money on the table for the buyer of your business, making it easier for you to sell it, which frees you up for your next adventure. In any case, I thank you for watching. I'm Marty Nemco. Feel free to give a thumbs up or, if necessary, a thumbs down, comment, share on your social media, uh, and or to subscribe to my channel. In any event, I do thank you for watching. I am Marty Nemco.